we have friends both skillful and generous who invited us down um, to spend six nights on their boat where they are um, where they have been and they're actually headed back home to Florida now um, for two months or so um, our friend Dave Stevens was able to do his work remotely uh, which is you know one of one of the things about modernity which is really quite remarkable and of course we also saw and you know, got introduced to a little bit of the navigation that he was using um, so they were <clears throat> he and Madeline his wife uh, were were cruising in and they invited us to be with them and we went down with our 16 year old son Toby in the Exumas, an island chain in the Bahamas that I'd never heard of before before they invited us. And it's right on the edge of a, a vast, like hundreds of square miles. And I actually couldn't totally figure out how big. I think it may be well over a thousand square miles of incredibly shallow water, like never goes below 30 feet deep and is often less than 10 feet deep. And of course, that's going to change somewhat with the tides. But that means that no boats with a deep draft can can explore these waters at all. And so you have... You have some very very nice boats, of course, but all with um, shallow drafts. You don't. It's not. You know. There's no cargo boats. There's no shipping lanes, uh, and for the most part, you don't have um, you know re, re, speed boats and other things that you may have come to associate with you know really gorgeous Caribbean water, you know, seascapes and landscapes. And so this this was in many ways a revelation. Being being down in this place, you know, the, the the first night that we were out, uh, we spent on anchor off of Shroud Key, and uh, the Shroud Key has no marina, no um, no no buoys even. I th- I think um, so. You just you know you have to be skillful enough to get there, um, to know to know the weather enough and know the tides enough and the and the and the soundings. I guess is the is the word for the depths, um, and to to put your anchor down safely and from there you can um you know dive in right off the boat and snorkel or take a skiff in through these uh through these creeks they're yeah they're not really creeks they're informally called creeks but they're right. basically cracks in these limestone uh outcroppings in which the salt water flows through exactly exactly and they are shroud key in particular is just lined with mangroves and when we heard, when I heard Madeline talking about the mangroves in advance, I, I imagined the mangroves I have known. And mangroves, mangrove is not a lineage. Like mangrove is a strategy that has evolved actually apparently more than 30 times. A strategy for, I'm a plant, I find myself in this really marginal place where most of the water that I have access to is salt water. And even if I can pull water in somehow from the rain that falls from the sky, my roots are still soaked in salt water. What am I going to do? And so there are a lot of different evolutions of the mangrove strategy. And I've been, I have been in a lot of them, as have you. We've been in mangrove in Madagascar, in Panama. I've been in mangrove in Mexico, in Costa Rica. I feel like other places, oh, in, in Honduras. Um, a lot of places, they're always kind of tall. And these mangroves are incredibly short and dense. And Presumably, this is because of the winds that are coming that occasionally come off the Atlantic in the form of hurricanes and you know lesser winds as well. Uh, but you can you can take a take a small skiff through these through these creeks, which are actually tidal tidal flow, and see green sea turtles and sharks, both nurse sharks and I think we saw another species, but we saw it briefly enough. I'm not totally sure. Rays. Um, fair number of fish, although um, the, the inside the channels there, you don't really have coral, so it's not the abundance of reef fish that we saw um, elsewhere on, on the coral reefs. And it's just an abundance of diversity that is extraordinary. And also, when you go someplace else and around coral reefs, you find the, the number of strategies, the number of, again, lineages of just fish, just fish we're talking about for the moment, that have learned how to make a living off a reef and who do things like specialize on cleaning the insides of other fish's uh, gills or mouths. And there are some scientists still who are saying, yeah, I'm not so sure. It's exactly the kind of symbiosis that we're thinking. Sometimes those bigger fish do, in fact, eat the smaller fish. Um, but they're really, and there are also some cleaner shrimp, dedicated cleaner shrimp. 
so there's that. There are these Bo Gregories, which are these as juveniles, they're bright blue and yellow who hang out in abandoned conch shells, live in abandoned conch shells. There are a number of fish who are uh, sequential hermaphrodites. We were observing parrotfish, for instance, which are protogenous hermaphrodites, which means proto first gin, giant uh, female. So they start out as females. And then some of them, if the male dies, the dominant female will turn into a male. And um, in every way, um, both her sex, she will start, she will move from producing eggs to producing sperm. Everything about her will change into a him, um, both anatomically and physiologically, and also behaviorally, the sex role, the gender, if you will. Uh, and there are other, there are other lineages that are hermaphroditic as well. And then the thing I learned about parrotfish on this trip, not from watching, but from watching, observing, us talking, and then looking in, I didn't bring it here, um, this fabulous field guide that I brought along with me, which is reef fish behavior for um, uh, Florida, Bahamas, and the Caribbean, I think is what it's called. They claim, and I actually did seek out uh, a paper suggesting that this is, this is a claim that is legitimate, that much of the sand on Caribbean Reefs and beaches came out the back end of a parrotfish. Yep. That parrotfish have these modified teeth that they've turned into beaks. They're very hard uh, and they rasp algae off of dead coral. And depending on the species and the mood of the parrotfish, sometimes they just bang their heads in the dead coral. And some of them are neater than others, but none of them are particularly neat. And they end up just taking in a huge amount of, of coral skeleton. And uh, apparently something like 75% of the gut content of parrotfish is inorganic material. And they've got specialized anatomical and physiological structures that grind the stuff down. And basically, if you follow a parrotfish, you're they, they're releasing a constant plume of this coral that has now been ground into tiny bits, which is what we call sand. Um, yeah. And my experience up until this trip was that on anything – that uh, you would call a coral reef, the sound of parrotfish chomping mm -hmm. is almost constant. And yeah, Snap, you, crackle, it, pop. It, it's constant snapping. Mm -hmm. And it was actually kind of rare on this trip. And I'm not sure what to make of it because, of course, we'd never been to this place before. So I don't know if the amount of it has dropped or this particular location, which has obviously a huge amount of sand associated with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, is just low in relative density of parrotfish. You know, we did see a few, but not many. Um, so anyway, it sort of left me wondering. I mean, clearly, given the amount, the volume of sand that we're talking about, we're talking about hundreds of thousands, probably millions of years of accumulated uh, right. parrotfish droppings are the fine sand on these beautiful Caribbean beaches. Yes. Which is a really cool fact. It's amazing. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, it was it was interesting. Um I, I must say that one thing that I got out of this little adventure that I had not gotten from any previous one, in general, you and I have sought out, you know, the great snorkeling wherever we go, mm -hmm. right? And the great snorkeling tends- Not in the Amazon so much. Right. Um, but uh, it tends to be, you know, a big reef and it's sort of the classic, you know, you drop off the boat or whatever it is and there you are and there's this giant uh, accumulation of coral heads and a huge number of fish and all of that. And in this case, snorkeling did not seem to be what the people who were there were doing mm -hmm. in any significant numbers. In fact, we were really the people doing the snorkeling enough that other people we spoke to were sort of curious about what we were seeing and where to go and all of that. And so what it did was it revealed what I think is the much more normal distribution of these reefs, which is a coral head here, a coral head there, large expanse of sand between them. And the so, seagrass, yeah. So in any case, it gave, the biologist in me was very excited to get good at figuring out where to go look for the reef fish rather than just be dropped in the place where they're every and, you know. Yeah, it was less like a nature documentary. It was less like it had already been curated or Disney-fied or whatever. And that's not to say that some of the other experiences we have had haven't been extraordinary. Oh, they've been great. Um, but having having to work for it a bit, right? And having to swim for it, and like sometimes swim a fair ways, uh, is th there's also a lot of reward. And just like okay, at some point I'm going to turn around because I've gone a while and there's just nothing but you know sand and seagrass and and yeah. oh. Whoa, whoa, like there's a there's a slope now and here we go. Like here here we happened upon another thriving area of diversity after a long expanse of, of seagrass. Yeah, it's actually it's its own kind of training program for mm -hmm. your mind. How well do you understand 
what these creatures are doing enough that you can look at a landscape and say, I bet if I go over there, I'll see it. And then sometimes you're right and sometimes you're wrong and your model gets better. But it's a little bit like when we take people into, you know, uh, an intact tropical rainforest and, you know, everybody's experience is the same when they walk into such a thing, which is, where are the critters? Right. I see it. Where's all the fighting it, and the sex and the yeah, exuberance? What I see yeah. is a wall of green I can make no sense of. Yeah. And the point is you you do learn to make sense of it, but you learn to make sense of it in some ways that you don't expect. You know, how do you find monkeys? With your ears. You almost always hear them before you see them, mm -hmm. right? And that's How do you find peccaries? With your nose. <laughs> with <laughs> you your smell nose. them before you see them or hear them. <laughs> right. And then you uh, think carefully about whether you want to confront <laughs> And where to stand. Right. It's, exactly. Um, not but, so much on reefs. I, I've, I've rarely run into peccaries on reefs. Yes. Yeah. That, <laughs> for some reason, we did not get <laughs> anywhere near to me. it. But uh, yeah. for some reason, somebody has pigs that tourists go to swim with in the Bahamas and the Exumas. I, I don't get. Yeah, it. that was a, it, it, we actually passed it on one of our yeah. one of our forays actually to get our final COVID test to be allowed to come back into the U.S. And I don't get it. I don't get it either. Hey. And it's domestic pigs. I, I who knows. Whatever it is, it's yep. not kosher. That's my feeling. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I was enjoying the learning how coral reef actually works rather than being dropped into the overwhelming experience and getting a very wrong idea i mm -hmm. think for what the majority of these you know fish and other creatures yeah. are now, do you want to show a few yeah why don't, why don't we show a few things and, and you know I, I i now realize after all the things you said i picked many of the wrong images no, and videos hey zach you want to put up the uh um All right. Well, let's try. How about the image of the tropic bird? So this mm. is a tropic bird, and so as we arrived at um, Shroud at Key. Shroud Key, mm -hmm. our first mooring, there were a group of these tropic birds engaged. And, and Brett is not misspeaking. This is it, this is. Also a tropical bird. We were actually just outside of the tropics. We were yep. at about 24 and a half degrees north and the tropic line is at 23 and a half. Um, but we were in, you know, this is a subtropical bird, um, but it's called a tropic bird. This individual bird. is hanging out just barely in the subtropics. Yes. But anyway, it's a tropic bird. These are uh, squid specialists. This is one of three species of tropic bird. Wait, what? The squid specialists. I didn't know that. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? I hope I'm speaking correctly about this species. But in any case, the cool thing about this, this demonstrated That's something. That's crazy. Yeah, it's wild. So, Heather, you and I and our family ran into tropic birds the first time on uh, Isla, de, Isla de, de la Plata in Ecuador, mm -hmm. where some guides um, offered us a choice that we could not make heads or tails of, where there were some Nazca boobies on one part of this island, and there were uh what they called tropical birds tropical birds and they asked you want us to if see we, the tropical if we wanted birds? to see the the nazca boobies or the tropical nazca birds nazca boobies being also tropical birds right. for those every of you bird that is there is a tropical bird. so home. we couldn't figure yes. out what they were talking about but but they seemed like the more exotic interesting thing would be the tropical birds so we followed them to see the tropical birds and it turned out it was tropic birds which we had never seen before mm -hmm. now i think i believe i have only seen tropic birds twice once in, on that excursion, and then here, as we pulled in to uh, to Shroud Key. Shroud Key, there mm -hmm. were a number of them vocally uh, interacting and chasing each other, and yep. it was very dramatic. Mm -hmm. And I immediately, you know, I, I have learned painfully as a photographer that if you arrive someplace and suddenly you see some creature and you think, "Wow, while I'm here, I'm going to get pictures of those," you may not see them again. Right. And so anyway, I took the camera out and I started trying to capture it so that at least I wouldn't, you know, walk away without anything. Yeah. And uh, anyway, it's a beautiful, it's beautiful bird. I think, believe this is a female. The yeah. males have an even longer train. Yes. Which raises really interesting questions about what the sexual selection regime is, that both the males and females are ornamented with this long train, but the males but the are person. longer. Yep. Uh, so anyway, there it is. Um Next Let's photograph? see. Next photograph. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could also just have him pop up since you gave our amazing yes. producer. So yep. these photographs, I haven't been through them. I haven't corrected them. This one obviously could use a little correction, but these are some, some turns that Your were- Your photographs uh, are beautiful. Uh, Sorry for those potential. of you just listening. Yeah, you're just listening. But anyway, here we have a pair of, uh, of turns on a, on a piling. 
um, one of them descending and landing next to the other. Actually, I got the whole sequence of the landing, and it was pretty comical. But, uh, yeah, it wasn't the most graceful landing I've seen. They're kind of comical birds. Yeah, they're pretty nice, though. It's like a, it's like a fancy gull. 